Hello, it's Dr. Daystorms, and this is the conclusion of Chapter 7, where we're going to be discussing the characteristics and properties of metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. The first thing is, let's review where their location on the periodic table. So, we have the nonmetals, which the nonmetals are on the right-hand side of the periodic table, with the exception of hydrogen. Hydrogen is in group 1, that first family of the periodic table, but it is not a metal. It is a nonmetal. So once in a while you'll even see some periodic tables put hydrogen on here twice and put it also right above fluorine. However, just remember, with the exception of hydrogen, nonmetals are on the right-hand side of the periodic table. Metals make up the most, the majority of the periodic table. They are on the left-hand side. And then you also have the lactonoids and actinoids. And finally, we've drawn in the past the little stair steps to find out where the metalloids are. Every element that touches two sides of the stair is a metalloid except for aluminum and polonium, which are both metals. Now, metals and nonmetals have very distinct properties, okay? And the differences between them tend to revolve around these properties. So, for example, metals, many times, are shiny, okay? They can be various colors, but a lot of them are silver, whereas nonmetals are usually lack this luster. They usually are kind of dull looking, Metals, if they're sol solids, they are malleable and ductile. And malleable means that you're able to uh, hammer it into different shapes. Ductile is the ability to be able to stretch it into thin wires. Okay? Whereas nonmetals are usually brittle. Sometimes they're hard, sometimes they're soft, but they tend to be brittle. Okay? Metals are good conductors of heat and electricity. That's the reason why you know they are used for electrical wiring. Whereas nonmetals tend to be very poor conductors of both heat and electricity. So they are better at being used for insulators. Most metals, whenever they form uh, bonds with oxygen, they are ionic bonds and they tend to be basic. Whereas most, almost all the nonmetals form oxides that are covalently bound, which we discussed that in chapter 8 in greater detail, and they tend to be acids whenever you put them into solutions. And then finally, if the metal becomes an ion, they tend to become cations, whereas nonmetals tend to become anions or oxyanions. Okay, and this is just an illustration of the periodic table to show some of the um, prominent cations and anions formed by each of these elements. Okay, these, this is not all inclusive because you know there are many uh, transition metals that also still form cations. However, they're just showing you some of the more uh, important ones and common ones that you see. We've already discussed and we'll discuss further in chapter eight the reasons why the elements in the group one of the periodic table tend to form mono, uh, monoatomic ions, uh, monovalent ions, which means that they are just a plus one charge. Those in group two A are two plus charges. The transition metals can vary. Aluminum is a three plus. And then likewise, we have the one minus, two minus, and three minus for the anions. Oops, it skipped over everyone. Okay, so once again, this is just a picture of, you know, metal here. We're talking about silver, it's how it's shiny, it tends to be malleable, ductile, and once again, it's just a good conductor of heat and electricity, whereas the nonmetals tend to be very dull, they tend to be brittle, because I can think of like chalk, and they are poor conductors, which means that they are better insulators against heat and electricity. Metalloids, oh, and once again, nonmetals tend to gain electrons in order to look like a noble gas, whereas metals tend to lose electrons to look like noble gases. <clears throat> 
many times whenever we have nonmetals that come together to form a bond, they're going to be covalently bound. We'll talk about that more in chapter 8, but they tend to be covalently bound, so they are molecular compounds, whereas a metal that binds with a nonmetal, that tends to be an ionic bond. Then we have metalloids. Metalloids can have some characteristics of metals and some of nonmetals. One of the most common of the metalloids is actually silicon. And please note it's silicon, not silicone. Silicon looks really shiny, but it's actually quite brittle. And it's only it's a fairly poor conductor, and so that's the reason why it's called a semiconductor. So let's talk about some of the trends that we can see between the different families. First up, we have the alkali metals. These are the ones from group 1A, if you remember. They, are, they tend to be soft, metallic solids, and their name actually comes from the Arabic word for ash. And that's because of the way that they react uh, quite uh, often with, with air and with water. Okay? They are not found as elements in nature. They are always found in some type of compound because they are highly reactive with, with, with air and water, or they can be highly reactive with air and water. They do tend to have low densities and melting points. So if we look, for example, the density of lithium and sodium are both less than one. Water, the density of water is approximately one gram per centimeter cubed. So lithium, in theory, would float on top of water. Of course, we won't Try that. And then, of course, they, they tend to have smaller atomic radius, and then their ionization energies are actually quite low. Okay. And the reason why is, once again, they like to look like noble gases, and so that's why they tend to lose that one electron in order to be a plus one charge. Their reactions are famously exothermic. It means it gives off a lot of heat. And rather than just looking at the the stagnant pictures of this, I thought that I would show you a little video of what happens if you put a a small piece of sodium in water, okay? Sorry about that, I'm having some internet issues with the streaming at this point. But you can see that it's quite flammable and it's very um, exothermic there. <clears throat> the alkali metals, except for lithium, will react with oxygen and they form peroxides, which are highly reactive and they can form free radicals. Whereas... Potassium, rubidium, and cesium also form superoxides, and this is just an example given. The one thing that they are really known for is that whenever you take the alkali metals and you place them in the flame, they give off bright colors, and they can vary in different colors. And so I just thought that I'd show you an example here for rubidium flame test. And now this is sponsored by, um, I think, the Royal Society. And so, but once we get through this, we'll be able to see the rubidium burning. I thought it was kind of cool that they also did it with, in the form of the, the chemical symbol of rubidium. But you can see that that is, is supposed to be a, like a violet color.
Now, for group 2A, the alkaline earth metals, they're going to have higher densities and higher melting points than the alkali metals. They also have slightly higher ionization energies, but it's still quite low with respect to, or as compared to other elements. Okay. The alkaline earth metals react differently with water, so beryllium doesn't react at all. Magnesium can only react with steam, so at high temperatures, but the others do react with water. And so you can characterize this trend as it increases as you go down the periodic table for group 2A metals. Then we're going to go over to the halogens. These are considered the textbook or the stereotype for nonmetals. Okay? And you can, if you notice a couple of things, I want to point out their melting points. Look at this melting point variation. As you go down the periodic table, the melting points greatly increase. Where fluorine, chlorine, and bromine all would be either liquid or gas at room temperature. However, iodine is a solid because it's at positive 114 degrees Celsius. That means it won't even, water actually boils before iodine would even melt. Their densities also greatly vary. Iodine is very, very dense. And of course, their atomic radius increases as you go down the periodic table. And then the ionization energies actually increase as you go up the periodic table. Okay, the name comes from the Greek meaning salt formers because a lot of times whenever they form an ionic bond between a metal and an halogen, they, they, those are known as being salts, like sodium chloride. They also have very large negative electron affinities, so they tend to oxidize other elements really easily because they want to take away the electrons so they can look like noble gases. Okay, and so once again, they react directly with metals to form metal halides, which are usually called salts. Just think of sodium and chloride. And then chlorine, of course, is added to water supplies to serve as a disinfectant. Then we have the noble gases, the group 8A. Their ionization energies are outrageously high. So if we look here, I mean, look at helium's ionization energy. It takes almost 2400 kilojoules per mole to remove that electron. It is perfectly happy with having a full uh, n equals 1 energy level. Okay? <clears throat> they have very, they have positive electron affinities, so because of this, they're essentially unreactive. In fact, they used to always be called, uh, they used to be called inert gases because of the fact that they were just unreactive. Now, they have found out some of the larger ones can react uh, with, with oxygen. Now, they are monatomic gases, which think of like the neon sign or argon signs. And uh, hopefully that's just giving you a little feel for, a little feel for the idea of um, some of the characteristics and the properties of some of the different metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. I'll see you in class.